Mr. Tharu, welcome to Young and Digital. There was a survey by a Malayalam channel the other day which said that you could scrape through in these elections in Thiruvananthapuram. Uh, you would win, they actually said, but you have lost the popularity which you enjoyed last elections. All these days of campaigning, do you believe that issues, uh, the controversies have actually hit your campaign? Well, look, I mean, I don't understand these controversies. I think mean, they've largely been manufactured. Uh, both by a sensationalist media and by an opportunistic opposition. But having said that, I have been through the constituency um, campaigning very actively and intensively. I've met people of all sections of society and of all ages and both genders. And the reactions I'm getting are overwhelmingly positive and supportive. So I don't know where this comes from. I think uh, we'll have to wait till the votes are counted to see how accurate this prediction is. You have been insisting that the controversies are not going to affect you, but what the opposition and even predominantly the media in Kerala says is that since 53% of your voting population consists of women, that they are going to be affected by some of this. So how are you, are you speaking to them directly about these issues? Are you addressing it or are you just turning a blind eye? Well, I am unfortunately deeply handicapped because as long as the police have not come up with a final conclusion in Delhi to their investigation to the cause of my wife's tragic uh, demise, uh, I have no basis for saying anything. And the charges being leveled against me are so outrageous and so completely baseless and people, you know, nothing, not even a shred of fact that to address them is to dignify the most vile thoughts that I never thought anyone could even think about. Uh, what do I say? I mean, do you expect me to, to go out and address every lie being flung in my direction? Because actually, I'll be playing into their hands mm -hmm. by moving the debate onto territory they want. Whereas if I focus on my work, my... Uh, accountability to my voters over five years and my record performance because very frankly many senior journalists have told me that in their experience of covering politics they've never seen an MP in five in one five-year term achieve so much that's the territory on which I want the election to be fought so it makes sense for me to focus on that and not be dragged into the territory they want to talk about mm -hmm. so for that reason I'm not addressing it but let me state for the record that it's contemptible what they're doing uh, there is no investigation into me the police have not found it fit to either charge me, investigate me, write an FIR against me, whatever, because frankly, there is no murder, there is no suicide, there is no wrongdoing. My poor wife, who was ill for some time, sadly passed away for natural causes. The process of identifying those causes has been set back by its whole firestorm of controversy in the media. They seem to have spent two and a half months looking for poison that wasn't there because of all these public allegations of poisoning which were not based on anything other than people's fantasies. So uh, the only poison was in the minds of certain politicians and certain journalists. But that poison has seeped into the process and it's, it's very sad. The basic fact is that not only is there no criminal, there is no crime. Mm -hmm. And yet this entire controversy has been whipped up out of thin air. So especially in Thiruvananthapuram constituency, do you think the fight is becoming extremely personal? First, we saw CPM leader Vijay Kumar making comments about you. Then it's been continued, uh, uh, the left and the BJP indulging in those kind of comments. So do you think, especially in this constituency in Kerala, we are seeing too much of a personal fight? Well, I think it's absolutely disgraceful. What's more, it's a violation of the Election Commission's Code of Conduct, which specifies that elections cannot be fought uh, by vilifying character assassination of your, of your, of your opponents. But unfortunately... Uh, the Election Commission does not appear to have taken enough decisive action. And they have merrily gone along their way, basing their entire campaign on these personal attacks. Because they have no answer to my development work. They have no answer to my performance. They predicted five years ago that if I won, I would never be seen again here in the constituency. The opposite has happened. They are now complaining, I'm seen too much, I'm all over the place. Uh, so they have no basis for a conventional campaign against me. They can't say he was never there. They can't say he never did anything. They can't say, you know, uh, uh, all the usual... Uh, stuff that opposition parties like to fling on incumbents, they can't say. Mm -hmm. So instead they've invented this totally fraudulent set of personal attacks. And if they succeed in poisoning the minds of a few voters, I think it will be sad. Uh, but I don't think it's going to result in my defeat. There will be some who will obviously uh, listen to these lies. Um, too many people believe that if there is smoke, there must be some fire. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't realize to what extent the smoke is politically motivated, obfuscation smoke and not real smoke. But the other thing is, of course, that uh, when mud is flung, some of it may st stick on me, but much more of it sticks in the, in the hands and under the fingernails of those who are flinging it. And may they enjoy that mud on their faces for some more time to come after the election results. So now moving away from the controversies, you were submitting these annual reports every uh, it was year. the first MP in India to issue an annual report. 
so what is it that you achieved in these five years which you promised and what is yet not achieved well i've, I've achieved so much that i've actually had to publish a 40 page report in malayalam and very small print uh, listing all the things so there's a great deal to give you a short summary i got the national highway bypass which has been hanging fire for 43 years since the stones were first laid approved i've uh, that's already going on the tender has gotten uh, for the first half of it and the second phase of it lands already being acquired checks have already chased, uh, changed hands i got the uh, or I helped get it's not appropriate i got it but i helped get the environmental clearance and the coastal regulation zone clearance for the Vilnium port, which has been hanging fire for 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to get record a number of funds from the Central Road Fund for improving the roads in my constituency, 114 crores. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a record. I got 14 new trains to my constituency. I got train stops for some of our uh, remote stations, Parashala in the countryside, has been demanding train stops for 30 years without success. I got them four express trains to stop and a memu train, which we never had before in this part of Kerala. Uh, I got stops for our Karakutam Techno Park uh, area station, a train stopping there. I managed to get a lot of funding for the health field, 179 crores for a new super specialty hospital, which has been inaugurated last year, functioning very well. 120 crores for our regional cancer center, 10 crores for our Ayurvedic hospital, 3 crores for our mental health center. All of these because of my personal lobbying with the health ministers uh, of the day in, 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 in Delhi. And so on and so forth. I brought in central institutions to Trivandrum that had never uh, had regional offices here before. The CPWD, the ICTE, the CBSC, the Kendra Vidyalaya all now have regional offices in, in, in Tiruvannathapuram. I persuaded the UAE foreign minister in a historic first for, uh, for Kerala to open a consulate in, in, in Tiruvannathapuram. The Germans to open a visa facilitation center. The Sri Lankans to open an honorary consulate. So we suddenly have an international profile to the city which never existed before. Uh, and these are just some examples. There are a hundred more I could mention and have mentioned in the booklet I told you about. So I've brought in a lot of things. I've also spent my MP funds in a very transparent way. I consulted public representatives. I spent them in small quantities, but throughout the constituency in 475 small projects, high mass lights to bring security after dark, particularly to our women, uh, libraries, anganwadis for, for children, particularly working women in the villages, have no place to leave their kids, and Anganwadi makes a big difference. I've constructed a number. Uh, toilets for girls in schools, very important because after a certain age, girls tend to need to go home to change, and if their home isn't nearby, they, they don't mm. come back, they tend to drop out. So that's a very important thing. My late wife was strongly associated with that cause, went to a number of schools, brought in some e-toilets to a number of schools. I, I miss her so much more when it comes to that. Um, there's also the... Um, the, the, the classic, you know, computers, school libraries, school buildings, all of these things that I've done. 475 small projects throughout the constituency. And again, reporting fully on every pesce spent under the MP uh, funds. So all of these things I've done for the constituency. And I'm saying to voters, I'm pointing my finger at work actually done that you can touch, see and experience. Go ahead and, and decide whether you want this kind of representative or not. It's not just you, but it's the entire, uh, it's your party, in fact. The other day while releasing the manifesto, the Congress president also said that most of the promises have been filled, what was said in the manifesto. You also say that this much has been done for my constituency. Still, why do you think as far as young India goes, there's, there is a sense of dissatisfaction, a sense of disconnect? Why, what, what do you think went wrong? Well, look, there is a revolution of rising expectations in our country, and it's most acute amongst the young. Uh, modern communications has also contributed to this. You see images of other nations, you deal with people easily now. I mean, you can see them, first of all, on satellite communications, on television, on cable TV. Secondly, you're connected to an increasingly international uh, sense of what's going on in the world. You're in professions where you're interacting with foreigners. You've got the Internet. You've got uh, various ways of being in touch with the rest of the world. And you're impatient to have it all yourself. Why shouldn't India? What's wrong? Why shouldn't we have everything that the most developed countries in the world already enjoy? And that sense of demand is exciting. It's positive. It's good. I welcome it. The problem is it takes steps to get from here to there. And we are starting off, uh, first of all, with huge ch challenges of poverty and underdevelopment. Our young people haven't really got a sense of how far we've traveled. Is that from because you didn't were. communicate? The government didn't communicate? And that's young. partly true. I think that, um, and that's partly true. It's also partly true that in these 10 years, we've transformed the face of India in ways that have affected people who are not so voluble and visible. The rural poor, for example, have had their purchasing power transformed, including the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. But that's not the kind of people you hear from on your mm -hmm. kind of show. Um, and at the same time, we've also done things which the young have taken for granted. 
They think right to information has always been there. They've always had the right to demand material and information from their government. Sorry, UPA gave, in, gave them that right. But we no longer get credit for it because the tendency, I sometimes joke, that in politics and in marriage, you know, there's no real savings bank. There's only a current account. You know, what you've done in the past is quickly forgotten. It's what have you done for me today? And voters are like that. And I find usually wives are like that too. Well, that's another Like a journalist is as important as their last story. Like. So when it comes to Kerala and jobs, uh, moving back to the issue of jobs, there is a lot of uh, the Kerala. One of the biggest concern, of course, is the pox, is the lacks of uh, lacks of jobs. So how would you or your party address that? Because there is a smart city project, there is a startup city project brought by Uman Chandi. But the the fact that that's not enough, there's a feeling that that's not enough. So what would you have to tell to the voters? See, in in Trivandrum, I have a very clear vision of what needs to be done because I'm afraid we're not going to attract industry and manufacturing into this. Economy largely because the, I mean, I've spoken to so many, I've actually lobbied even before joining Indian politics. After leaving the UN, one of the first things I did was to try and encourage investment into Kerala. And I even wrote about it and, and so on. But I meet too many people, including even Malayali investors outside, who say they would much rather invest in a neighboring state because they're afraid the moment they set up a factory, there'll be people with red flags making unreasonable demands. The communists of Kerala have, have destroyed Kerala's reputation as an investment destination for that kind of industry. So where we can score is, in my view, in two areas. One is tourism, which, of course, tends to absorb a lot of labor, including semi-skilled and unskilled labor. And the second is the knowledge industry. Knowledge industry both directly and indirectly. Obviously, the direct thing, the creation of institutions like Knowledge City, which I've worked with Sam Petula to bring into Trivandrum, uh, as well as, of course, uh, bringing in more research institutions, strengthening the expansion of the Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, which I did, um, working with, um, with uh, private companies to come. I persuaded Oracle to come and open an office in, in, in a center in Technopark in Trivandrum. I persuaded Accenture to come here. Uh, all of these things generates jobs amongst people who have, of course, certain but level of qualifications. But not as much as the manufacturing. But then what happens is their presence generates ancillary jobs. So if you bring in 75,000 knowledge workers who are all PhDs and research scholars and MBAs and, and cost chartered accountants and so on, maybe all of them will not be Trivandrumites. But they will need restaurants, they will need buildings, they will need hotels, they will need places to stay, they will need malls to go to, they'll need multiplexes to watch movies, they'll need more shopping centers. Everything suddenly will generate work in the construction industry, it'll generate work in the, in the semi-skilled area, it'll, it'll, it'll employ a lot of locals in supporting this. So my strategy would be create a solid knowledge cluster in this, in this. create an ecosystem of knowledge industry, and around it, other jobs will have to grow up as well. So you're throwing your hands up as far as the manufacturing industry goes. I'm not throwing my hands up. I think the, the more we can defeat the communists politically mm -hmm. and reduce them to an irrelevancy, the greater the likelihood they will not be able to thwart industry. But right now, industry is still scared of the communists because they're such a big force here. And they're so unconstructive. And they claim to be for the poor, but they're the ones who are keeping the poor poor by denying them the opportunity of decent jobs through their red flag policies and their strikes and their hartals. Kerala is about the only place left now where the left throws a hartal every few weeks for something or the other. And people just don't want that. You know, a manufacturer will have a deadline to meet to ship some goods. Mm -hmm. He says, if the commies uh, call a hartal, I'll miss my deadline. I'll have to pay a fine or I won't get my... I can't afford to take that risk. I know so many Malayalis who have gone and open industries in Tamil Nadu. And I begged them, why not come here? And they said, it's much easier working in Tamil Nadu. I said, you know, our electricity situation is better here than Tamil Nadu. They said, we'll take that risk if Nestle will have our own generators. That's a predictable cost. Politics, communism and hartals are unpredictable cost. We can't take that risk. But whatever be the perception about communists, the fact that the government, the Congress-led government in Kerala is facing so many controversies, especially the recent high court observations about the chief minister, do you think that as a whole is going to affect uh, elections and candidates uh, of, the Cong of the UDF across Kerala? I hope not, and I personally don't think so, because first of all, this is a judicial process that is beginning to play itself out. I am personally convinced the chief minister is a man of integrity, and I'm sure that at the end of the process, that will be clearly established. In any case, there is no charge sheet or case against him, mm -hmm. it's against somebody who worked in his office. And that person, certainly the government wants to see prosecuted, and we'll see what comes out of it. The important thing to understand is, in any case, the chief minister is not a candidate. None of his ministers are candidates. It's a Lok Sabha election. Hmm. We are voting to determine who rules India uh, at the end of this process. And I don't think the majority of voters in Kerala want to see either the Narendra Modi-led uh, BJP in power, nor do they want to see a chaotic bunch of people uh, organized around uh, a resurgent left. 
So I think they'll give both of those parties a strongly uh, thumbs down kind of message from, from Kerala. Since you mentioned Narendra Modi first, uh, is Modi going to be a factor in Kerala? especially in Thiruvananthapuram where we know that there is there is at least some sort of a movement and he's come here so many times to campaign. So do you think there would be at least a lot of votes which go to the BJP? In fact, it will split your vote bank. No, look, the B BJP uh, certainly seems to think so, judging by the, the gigantic... Not the BJP, I'm asking about the Modi factor. Yeah, I'm just saying the BJP seems to think that Modi is a factor because of the gigantic posters and hoardings of Modi all over the place. Sometimes dwarfing their own candidate, Rajagopal, who's far better known here than Modi is. Uh, and, and sometimes looking quite incongruous, this, this funny guy with the, with the turban and Rajasthani safars and so on, trying to appeal to the Kerala voters seems slightly odd, but I mean, that's the BJP's lack of connect to Kerala that's visible in their ad campaign. But nonetheless, they clearly think so, and Mr. Modi has been here three times. Mm -hmm. So uh, at one point, they even floated a rumor in the papers that he was considering adding Trivandrum to his constituencies, mm -hmm. and I said, he's welcome, you know, he will teach him a lesson here. But he didn't indeed uh, go that route, and they, they found... Uh, a venerable, frequent loser to contest instead. Now, let me say very honestly that the BJP has no chance to win. This may be the constituency where they'll get the highest number of votes because traditionally this has been a stronghold hmm. uh, of the BJP. But the idea of a stronghold is one where they score 18 percent, 15 percent. Sometimes I think in one occasion, one election, they got about 20 percent. But they can't do more than that. And indeed, uh, a vote for the BJP in Trivandrum is actually a vote for the left. Because what will happen is that uh, uh, the kind of, um, if you like, educated urban professional that Mr. Modi's new look BJP is trying to appeal to would not be a communist voter, would probably be leaving the Congress to vote for the BJP. Mm -hmm. And as a result, if they vote in enough numbers, the BJP can never win here, will never get as many votes as I will, but could certainly risk uh, bringing me down to a level where the left could actually score. So um, I certainly hope that the BJP begins to think afresh and those people who are not traditional hardline Hindutva, Muditva types will ask themselves if they really want as a result of their vote to end up with a, a communist representative coming out of this constituency. But as a whole across the country, do you think the Congress somehow missed uh, to project itself on the development plan? Because that is the PR factor as far as the BJP and Narendra Modi goes. I think that you are actually not being totally accurate. First of all, I think that the hardcore current of the BJP campaign throughout the country is still very much an RSS campaign. Modi is a lifetime RSS pracharak. And uh, the backbone of his campaigning, even in Thiruvananthapuram, mm -hmm. is the RSS. They're the ones who are out there or on the streets. Um, in fact, the people who have come to the BJP from a non-RSS background have been largely sidelined and marginalized. The Jaswan Singhs, the Sushma Swarajs, they essentially are, are, are not significant players in the new Modi BJP. And part of the reason is because it's an RSS core BJP. Uh, the second message is that Hindutva was the original calling card of Mr. Modi. 2002 is worn as an article of faith without a single apology for 12 years, uh, only because the message must be clear to the hardcore that this is what they're really all about. Mm -hmm. Development is the window dressing. Development is a message to win over the likes of you and me and people in, in, in offices who have high expectations and think that somehow uh, a development plank will be safer in the hands of a decisive actor. Uh, and you know, that message, clearly the publicity machine has worked very well and it's been able to even reach you as somebody who's asking me this question. To my mind, the Kerala voter will not buy it. Because in every respect, the Gujarat model is inferior to the Kerala model. Uh, to give you one example, uh, we have a, a tragic situation in our state where 22 women out of 1,000 die in childbirth. Mm -hmm. In Gujarat, 68 women out of 1,000 die in childbirth. You look at the Human Development Index, where you basically have literacy, hospital beds, number of doctors and nurses per population, number of newspapers per population, schools, child malnutrition, all of these factored in together. Kerala is first in Indian human development. Gujarat is 12th. So our message is, please don't do to us, Mr. Modi, through your model, what you've done to Gujarat. We're better off than you are. Okay. My last question is about social media and the young. Uh, you are one of the first politicians to really make it big on social media. Are you still using that as a platform now? Because uh, there, there's, of course, a lot more flurry of activity on your social media profiles. There's this whole video you put up on the Barcelona City Twin Project. So are you still um, hoping that a lot of voters come from there? and? 
please tell us about the Congress also. As a party, do you think the Congress should have harnessed the social media better? No, I've always been an advocate of social media for some time. And one of my arguments has been that don't be misled by the fact that there is such a small percentage mm -hmm. of people on the Internet in India. You know, the conventional assumptions are because 10 to 12 percent of our population is on the Internet. They can't decide, determine an election. How does it matter? Well, there are two answers to that. First of all, there are studies indicating that the number of constituencies where the social media users are larger in number than the winning margin of a candidate is as high as 160 constituencies. So it's in any case not a number you can afford to ignore. But more important, what people are missing is the fact that there are two trends happening that they're simply overlooking. One is that young people are more and more on social media, not only in English but in regional languages. And it's an overwhelmingly young demographic profile whom you need to reach because it's their country. 51% or 50 point something percent of our population is under 25. And the second trend is you're looking at the 12% people who are on the internet and internet cafes and computers. But what you're forgetting is that the mobile phones are in the hands of over 70% already hmm. and will reach 80% within five years. At the same time, we're going from 3G to 4G technology. And internet access on your mobile phone is going to be much cheaper, uh, more easy, faster, and more affordable. And so suddenly, you're going to have a dramatic revolution in which 80% of your population potentially can be on the internet on their phones. The moment that happens, those who are not already in the social media space are going to have missed the trick. Mm -hmm. so the ones who are there will have a major first mover advantage with the majority of those. So have you all already missed the bus? I don't think so. I think that we've woken up to this late. I mean, when I say we, I mean the party has woken up to this late because, uh, frankly, the misfortunes that I went through in my early days of social media adoption, uh, I think frightened off some people. I mm. think otherwise uh, they would have adopted it earlier. Uh, the BJP was smart enough to do it first uh, in a big way. And uh, the Congress has followed suit and is doing as well. In fact, uh, uh, for every nasty BJP hashtag, there is a witty Congress hashtag. You know, when, uh, every time something is trending against us, something trending for us or against them. So all of that now is pretty much even Stevens. My only argument is that that's not what social media should only be about. Hmm. There should be what I enjoyed in my first two, three years, which is now much more difficult, is genuine interaction with genuine voters. Hmm. So one of the reasons we put out these videos, and it was not just in Barcelona, it was half a dozen questions that have been sent to us by genuine people on Facebook and, and Twitter were clearly not trolls, but just people asking real questions. And so the answers were posted as a way of sort of a dialogue with the questioner, uh, which is what the original purpose of social media was all about. It's an interactive platform. It's an interactive Akashwani or Doodarshan or whatever, uh, rather than one-way traffic. And that's what I'm very happy to have done. I will continue doing more of it. Uh, in fact, this interview, uh, we will tweet and we'll put on Facebook. Okay. With that note, thank you very much for joining Young and Digital. Thank, thank you. you. Nice talking to you then.